very nice, Jeremy. So you've been, you're a, you're a semi-retired professional skateboarder, right? Are you, would you still consider yourself a professional skateboarder? I guess semi-retired is a good word, yeah, because I did retire fully and only focus on music. But at this point, when I skateboard, I, I, I do so and believe I do so on a professional level. And I still sell skateboards when I choose to. So I, I personally would still consider myself a professional, but not highly active. Absolutely. I hear what you're saying. You know, there's a, there's a certain requirement. Now, can we talk a little bit about that? So you voluntarily chose to, to ch switch careers, basically. You were, you were at the height of your career, and you started to do music. And, and like we were saying prior to this, you started to do music, and you, you said, we got to go all in on this. So does an artist need to go 100% on something? You can't have hobbies. You can't be one foot in. What do you think about being a drag of all trades? You know, a lot of people these days, they got lots of hobbies, lots of things they're trying to pursue at once. Um, I mean, if your last name is Reacher, if you're Jack Reacher, I guess you could be a jack of all trades and you'd be all right. But, uh, and I think Tom Cruise is sometimes. But, um, no, I, um, yeah, basically it got to a point where there was a line in the sand for me where one skateboarding became a job, just over broke, and, um, acronym for job. And then also, I, um, I didn't, I didn't care if I was the worst artist on the planet. I at least wanted to be introduced and considered an artist as opposed to, I was always introduced, this is a skateboarder who makes music. I wanted to be an artist even if the worst one, which I was definitely considered for quite some time. A lot of people fear when you do things like that. You know, they say you dropped it. We wish what you, we had what you had and you gave it up and now you're doing this. They don't know what that's like. That's, well, that's exactly that's exactly the perspective from a lot of them. That's why I got a lot of hatred at first. He I put it in perspective. He was like, if Kobe quit the Lakers to go, you know, play golf or whatever, his fans would be pissed. They don't want to see him play golf. They want to see him play basketball. So aside from that aspect, it was also like, I was the first skateboarder and maybe the last one that I know of within Aston Martin and stuff like that was like, bro, come on, bro. Like, fuck you, basically. You know, like, come on, bro. We're working wherever, skate shop, to, to, to have nothing, and we break our bones too. What gave you the confidence to do this? Because a lot of people would have left off where you were at. They would, they would not have been willing to make that leap, give up the Aston Martin, all that stuff. What gave you that confidence? Hey, Ju hey Julian, my friend Julian Highwork is back here. Check this out. He asked me what gave me the confidence to do that, to, uh, to retire. Well, honestly, it was mostly hookers, um, high-level high escorts. Who told me what I needed to hear? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Some, sometimes this the the, the 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 nugget of gold is found in the least expected places. I'm, I'm, that's a joke. I'm totally kidding. They, hookers don't usually add confidence to a man. But um, um, I uh, I mean I did gymnastics when I was younger. You know, I flipped around and landed on my balls sometimes then too. And I uh, I played on a traveling all star team, even though. Um, you can't travel in baseball, only in basketball, but, um, get it <laughs> traveling. Um, but, uh, but I don't know. I just was a pursuer of, uh, what my heart desires, which is usually at this point, either music or some girl I see on Instagram <laughs> or real life. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. Jeremy. So with regards to that, man, like I said before, what, uh, were you born with this fearless mentality where you said, you know, if I can be a professional skateboarder at 15 years old, right? You turned professional at 15, was it? Um, well, I actually started getting a check at 14 for $350 from a company, Chapman. So in some people's eyes, taxpayers' eyes, I was professional then. But I wasn't actually professional and got a board by industry standard uh, until like 20 or 21 on girl. But girls like Harvard for skateboarding, it's really hard to go pro there. Right, right, very, very well said, very well said. Now, can we talk a little bit about music and the industry today and how it's shifted and, and, and keeping up with that shift? You know, Kanye's coming out with his new music. He's always kept up with what's come out. How are you staying updated with everything, consuming your music and letting it facilitate your work? Well, my friend, uh, come here, I'll introduce you real quick, Julian. He, uh, come on, show your face. Um, he, he helps me keep up to date with what's going on in the industry, the business politics of it. He asks me how I keep up to date with whatever. Julian sits at his computer all day and studies numbers and things going on. What's happening, Julian? Nice, nice to meet you. Or the growth god or whatever. Because his penis grows. No, <laughs> as he helps you get your numbers right. But um, he, pay, he pays attention. I, 
I don't pay excessive attention, but I do have some stone cold inspirations. Like David Geffen is one of my favorite people ever. He brought us Aerosmith, Guns N' Roses, DreamWorks with Steven Spielberg. Uh, he after he made his first billion dollars, well, that was his last billion because after a billion, he donated everything that he made after that. Very nice. He's a rock for me. Um, Very nice. Which, don't take that the wrong way, because he was gay, so he's not a rock for me. <laughs> <laughs> what does it take, Jeremy? What do you think it takes for these, these legendary characters that a lot of people look up to and aspire to be like, you know, all these figures? What, it, what is it? Is it the mentality? Is it, is it the, the tunnel vision to pursue what, what you got to pursue? Will Smith would say tunnel vision mentality as well, but he says, I have to have laser focus. Um, one, here's an example, a quote from David Geffen, actually. He said, the average person, when they see a Lamborghini, they think, I want to own a Lamborghini, the car, you know? He says, when I see Lamborghini, I think I want to own Lamborghini, the brand, not the car. So by, by that um, type of perspective and, and having that in your eye line, like, uh, you know, Elon, who wants Mars instead of the moon, you see farther, you at least get the moon on the way, you know? And for Absolutely. Elon to land on the moon right now, it's a, it's a flick of the wrist. That's what you got to do. You said it. You got to you got to have high high expectations for what you want to accomplish. You know, and you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna hit some pretty big milestones during that pursuit. One thing I, I think you have to release on the expectations level is um is timing. You have to be willing to accept that there's some divine intelligence out there that knows timing better than you do. So you don't necessarily hit milestones or certain markers when you want to, but if you can keep the faith and keep the persistence, then it typically turns out that it was better for you. You become wiser. You're now you're less wasteful with money. You, you understand different things, you know? So I think you have to release the expectations of timing, but you hang on to the destination. So, and then it doesn't really matter how you get there. If you web off a little to the left, a little to the right, uh, as long as you still wind up at, at home, you know, and live at home in your skin, then so be it. Is this something you constantly reinforce yourself with every morning? What's your morning routine like? Are you saying these things to yourself? Are you meditating? Today, well, today I got up at 12.30 because I had a 2 p.m. interview with you. And then uh, I owed Julian a bottle of whiskey. So... By the time I watched the episode of Family Guy, which is good writing, and I was wanting to take a shower and I went to go get it, I wasn't going to make it in time for the interview. And I got a haircut first. Looked all right. Fresh. Like you. Looking all fresh. Sharp. Uh, so my morning routine today wasn't really as, that, as professional as it should have been. But no, I don't, ha I, don't, I don't really have to reinforce what I already know. Like, let, let's say gravity, for example. If I drop this stupid vape pen that I probably shouldn't even be smoking, it falls every time. Uh, that's just gravity. I just know that at this point. So I don't need to wake up and remind myself, don't fucking jump off the balcony. Yeah, you know, I'm well aware. Right, so right. The acronyms or the, or the, the, the um, gems of life, I would call them, that I live by, I live by them tomorrow unless someone corrects or alters one of them, you know? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. What do you think about all of these uh, artists coming out on on social media with platforms like Spotify, being able to to sort of be their own artists? You know, you talked a lot about this in the past. Uh, and, uh, you you had this kind of early on, and some ideas like this I remember hearing. And you know, the artist giving the power in the to the artist that's sort of happening right now a little bit, right? It is, it is, and, it, and it's really hard. Again, this guy Julian back here, he. <coughs> He works, he did a 14 hour day the other day. He's just sitting here crunching numbers, checking algorithms, checking stuff. Cause you know, we'd like to be, we'd like to be a subsidiary to a label of anything, but we'd like to be self sustaining, self operating. <laughs> so it, it isn't easy. Um, and there, there's funny things I just found out about the other day. Hopefully no one from a label sees this cause I do want them to give us some money to work with. Um, <laughs> but they do a funny trick where they give you, say they give you a million dollars. Then you go to their studios, to their producers, to their engineers, to their marketing team. And you end up pouring that whole million aside from jewelry and cars and stupid stuff you buy. Then you pour the rest the 700,000 right back into their company. So now you're in debt a million dollars and then they, you want more money. They give you, 
another million and it's you pour it right back into their same plantation you know absolutely absolutely that's something i'm, I'm hopefully they don't see and i'm not going to discuss with them when i whenever we meet with people because I, I i don't I, i'd prefer they give me their money and don't worry about the fact that i'm probably going to flip their money on anything from stocks bonds to flour to anything else real estate and then give them back their money and then go my way unless they will have a lot more I think I think you know you realize it sounds like that you know every a lot of these businesses are out for their own su success and not for themselves so you in some regards in many regards have to be looking out for yourself always at the most but you don't always have to let them know because they don't like they do they don't mind you in debt if you're an artist because then they can control your your content your your image or whatever you know and, and that's one thing I won't be is uh, controlled by the, the next man. Did you ever feel like you were in that position when you were a professional skateboarder? Because it looks like now a lot of it is character-based, a lot of it is your image. Uh, sort of like with the UFC, right? You see a lot of success with these fighters, and sometimes it's the fighters who have the backstory and the whole business uh, marketing machine behind it, right? A lot of these other guys who just sort of stick to the work and just punch, keep punching away, they're not, they're not getting that same sort of attention, right? What do you think about that? Well, I um, I always went against the mold a little bit. Like, excuse me, um, excuse me again. Um, I guess maybe excuse me a third time in advance, just in case. No, um, <laughs> me, me and P. Rod and this guy Terry Kennedy, who just got in some trouble, I guess. Uh, it's too bad. Um, we were stupid, and me and Terry did a lot of stupid gangster stuff when we were younger that we didn't need to be doing, and we skated uh, skated underneath the a coattail of like that invincibility cloak you have when you're young but he i guess he got a homicide charge recently and uh i feel bad for him but we're like we're grown men right now he shouldn't be getting in fights or whatever you know <laughs> but either way me terry and p rod we created a site called skate site which was the first skateboard website like one that was like the barracks and the barracks made the barracks after us and then i did a video called um jeremy rogers neighborhood which was the first video at the time, uh, to my knowledge, which was in a, a skate sh shop video where a pro did a video outside of the constructs of the company. And right. usually we, we worked our asses off for a year or whatever to get a video part for a company like Girl or Plan B or whoever. Uh, they're not whoever, I wrote for them too, but, and you get nothing off it. Off the Jerry Rogers Neighborhood video, I got a $50,000 advance. So uh, I was, a you know, self uh, monopolizing pretty early on and, and paying attention to numbers, how much a board cost and things like that. Do you think that's going to affect the skateboarding industry in many ways that we have not seen yet? Because, you know, you hear that the price of the skateboard has never gone up since it's been begun getting manufactured. And do you think with all of these new, with it being in the Olympics, and can you provide some light on that? What, do you think there's going to be a big change with that? Is, how are skateboarders all going to be able to make a living off of this? Will they be able to? If they were smart, I mean, I have a, a system that I use personally which I'm willing to lend out. Um, and I wouldn't mind my kickback off it, but um, the price of a skateboard has gone up. It used to be 50 to $55. Now, like when I go on Plan B site, it's $66 for the average board. And then shipping's not included. Um, but pros right. have always gotten $2 a board. That's the industry standard. Pros also get $2 a shoe, which a shoe is mm -hmm. 70 to $80 or more, you know? kind of weird um i get when i sell a skateboard i get thirty dollars wow uh, i sell I, I sell direct to consumer and i get thirty dollars and i did a company selfish where i was getting six dollars and giving my pros that and i get thirty dollars you know and i make a i make a board for 15 and and uh, the rest of the system i'm not going to tell you because they haven't figured it out yet hmm. all right i understand i understand i save money on overhead and stuff like that that makes sense, and that's what you got to do. I mean, two dollars. You said everybody in the industry standard is two dollars, and you're making thirty. Two dollars, yeah. And that's with thirty is with me, um, including free shipping on a fifty dollar flat board. Not flat, but fifty dollar flat fee. 
Very nice. And why do you think others? Uh, do you think other professional skateboarders are going to follow into your footsteps with this model of thinking? Just self. Well, well, they should. Someone like Nigel, who has a problem with me, so he hasn't really listened, and I haven't really given it to him because he has this whatever funny thing. But him, for example, the average pro—I mean, not average pro, but the average super pro—maybe they sell around like three thousand boards a month. And I told Shane about this a long time ago at uh, this guy Chum Lee's house, actually in Vegas. And I told Shane, I ran, I ran some numbers for him. And he was like, you're crazy, mate. That's impossible, mate. Da, 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 da. And then, um, you there? So yeah. I cut out because my battery is low. And, um, and I guess I went, where did I have it at? Let's say, let's just say, I think 2,000 boards a month. So 500 boards a week. I said, if you drop 500 boards a week, independent, directly to consumer, and you do like, you know, um, specific graphics they only come out one time and you're getting now 2,000 times uh, 10 is 20 so you're getting um, $60,000 a month he could be getting at $30 a board and he thought that was impossible but now he does his own brand you know so he yeah. obviously like took heed to what I said you know and, and definitely didn't write me a check but that's okay the point is I, I believe in the skater and I would like them to be self-sustaining and not well, be, he, yeah, I mean, that's worse than an artist for, for a label, which is considered like, you know, my friend calls it plantain, like, like slave, slave ships, an artist for a label, they can still make, you know, like $5 off a $10 album, $4 off a you know, so to get $2 off a $50 product, is it not justified? There is cost, there is expenses, but they're gobbling them up. Right. Right. It becomes not worth it for the artist or the talent uh, behind it. I mean, it's worth it if they're lazy and they don't want to conduct their business. Uh, here's an example that I'll use, which I, uh, uh, I, I hope he doesn't get mad at me about it. But anyway, a partner of mine that I had a band with for a year called Fondue, which we didn't put out. Um, we had the only original member from Sublime uh, in the band, Eric Wilson, on the bass. And then we ended up breaking up. I had a fight with a drummer. Whatever the case, Danny Way, I, I believe DC was made after Danny and Colin McKay. That's why it was DC. And um, hmm. sometime later, they sold DC, I think, to Echo. or I, I'm not sure. I forget who. Um, but they sold DC for $800 million. And there was four main partners, Damian Way, his brother, and Ken Block, and two other guys. I'm not sure their names. Um, not that I'm not interested, but I don't know their names. And um, they sold it for $800 million and they split it four ways. 200, 200, 200, 200. And Danny Way didn't get anything. Um, you know, and uh, it seems crazy and outrageous. You know, Danny Way's doing fine now. Uh, and always been doing fine. But that was, that was he, he was pretty bothered by that, you know. His own brother didn't give him anything. The way that I see it is... You know, he was being a rock star and a skater at the time, and they were the ones moving the needle and getting it to that sell point. And I imagine they were like, well, what? But anything we give him, unless it's equal, he's going to be offended. So if we give him $50 million, he's still going to be offended. Say, why is this company that was made around me, am I getting less than you guys? So either way, he was going to be offended. So I imagine, I don't know this for sure, but in my brain, I imagine that Danny Way, his brother, and the rest of the team was just like, Teach him a lesson, you know what I mean? So that he minds his business and pays attention and cares for it as, as, as he should if he's going to run a business, or anyone should. Ab ab absolutely. I mean, all we all everybody thinks about with Dan with DC is jumping the Great Wall of China, Danny Way, you know, that's what you think about, not these other characters who can end up keeping the larger piece of the pie. Always, you see that always, even with... with Many different companies. They kept they kept the whole pie, but yeah, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, like 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 said, and you're seeing it a lot with with even movie stars now. You're seeing it with Scarlett Johansson. I forgot. I think it's Gerald Butler. Now now they're coming after the studios. I love her so very much. <laughs> did, did you watch the movie? Did you watch the Black Black Widow? Yeah, it wasn't my favorite one of hers, but I love her a lot. I actually have a. I had a baby tooth right here, and uh, it just fell out. And I'm not gonna tell you how old I am, but I'm 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 30 at least, uh, not 40. But 
Uh, it's pretty, you could look it up, I'm sure. But whatever the case, um, at over 30 years old, I have a baby tooth and I was at Jojo Rabbit. I was with one of my partners at the time and it started getting loose for the first time. And I was like, if I get this tooth out, if this tooth falls out while we're in this movie, I'm telling Scarlett, and I'm not gay, I'm not like, not no, no homo thread, but I was like, we smashed a girl together before, and I was like, I'm going to walk up to Scarlett and tell her fucking, hey, where's me and my, my, my partner here, are pretty much destined to have a threesome with you, we made a bet on it if my tooth fell out in this movie. <laughs> Just, you'll be like, what the fuck, you're crazy, but... Hmm. I'm sure they hear all this extravagant stuff right in front of them, and they just, they know what to, sometimes they probably respond, stuff like that happens, absolutely. I mean, but not usually a baby tooth doesn't fall out at fucking 30-something years old, you know? Hey, it's for some people. I guess. For you, for, hey, for you, man. Yeah. What are you doing to stay in shape, or with the, keeping the mind diet healthy, are you on a strict diet, you know, you are a former professional athlete, and you still perform at a professional level, you know, what are you doing to keep that maintained? I love this. I love coconut water. Um, I don't know what it does, but it tastes good. Um, I don't really, I mean, I just eat healthy. I cook my, I cooked a burger for me and my friend earlier. It was an impossible burger with grilled onions and, and a ketchup with black summer truffle. And I don't know, I, I eat, I I eat well. That's the main thing. When there's money in my pocket, I'm going to eat well. Um, um, and, but I've always been physical, so I, I don't know. I've never, never put on weight really, you know, except when I was in jail one time for three months, I put on 15 pounds. Um, would you go to jail for three months for, can you talk about that? Yeah, that's fine. Um, Nigel, well, not Nigel, but Nigel's, um, some of Nigel's, um, close people, like some, um, entrepreneurs he dealt with from where he's from. And then somebody that I used to live with. They got in a fight at a club. We were at this nightclub lore and they jumped this guy and uh, pretty bad. And I went literally, I literally just got close to like stop the situation if I could. And when he got, when he was down on the ground, I, I helped him up and told him like, come on, you got to get out of here, buddy. You should get out of here. And then, um, I don't know. He, he, he looked me up and assumed there was some money to be had. So they came and arrested the guy that I was living with. I'm going to leave his name out of it because he's somehow still mean to me. Um, and then they wanted me, they put me in the interrogation room and wanted me to basically rat him out and say he punched him first, yada, yada. And I didn't. They say, well, yeah, today. And then once they booked me, I had old traffic violations and things. Um, literally just traffic violations. But because it was a, 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 felon, a violent felony charge, it, there was GBI, which we were facing, which is great bodily injury. Or, or great breast implants. I'm kidding, I just made that up. Um, yeah. <laughs> Those are cool. Um, <laughs> these days. Um, I had to do 85% of the time instead of 10 like I would usually. So I did three months in county. And I had to do the white power workouts every day. It's segregated out here. It's rough. It's rough. Yeah. But it was so nice. different it was atmosphere. Nice. Yeah, definitely a different atmosphere that I would never want to go back to. But I'm, I'm grateful that I went through the experience. That's, wick that's wicked insane, man. You know, that stuff happens to a lot of people, especially out here. You're in that bar scene in Hollywood. For those of them, mid to Hollywood, you see that left and right. Sometimes it's like... Now, okay. Go ahead. Wait, one, one more thing about that. So, so I, did, I had to do the three months before I could even bail out. You know? I did, a, I did a month and a half, and then I was bailing out. I was paid. My bail was paid. It was like two grand bail. And then I'm on my way out and I'm in this, in this room where they're letting you out the tank and they, uh, there's ice immigration, whatever. And they call a lot of names like for like deporting people and stuff. And then they called my name while I'm waiting to get pulled out. And I'm like, what the fuck? And they sent me on one more driving on a suspended license violation. And then I got another 180 days and I had to do another month and a half. So I got sent right back to the beginning after. And I was like, holy shit. Okay. These guys are on my body right now. I have no control over it. And then I bailed out and then we fought the case from outside and we did a two week trial and we were facing five years uh, in prison. And again, uh, it's just cause I'm loyal and whatever. And I didn't want to, didn't want to incriminate this guy. I didn't take the stand one time because if I did, I would have incriminated him, you know? So for, I went through a two week trial, 
Uh, and the best I could do was as they're spewing bullshit and trying to involve me in this thing, they didn't even subpoena the video for like two weeks. And in the video, you can see I'm not in the fight, you know, I'm just like close to it for my own reasons, trying to help. And, um, so I didn't take the stand once for two weeks. Most I could do is like when this guy's talking bullshit and, and involving me was like make faces at the, at the jury, like, oh my God. you know what I mean? Like keep my voice down, but make, you know, show character nuances of, like, I can't believe this shit, you know? And they pushed too hard. So then we got acquitted of all charges, me and him, you know, but I didn't take a stand once facing five years for something I had nothing to do with nor whatever. Yep. Yep. It's a very strange with the cameras now too. It sometimes it's like, you gotta, even when you don't want to walk away from stuff like that, because that once they got the video footage, you're seeing it everywhere. Once you edit something, piece it, perceive it one way, it's all the narrative behind it all, and it's not not worth it. Yeah. Well, I mean, their, narr their narrative was too much. But anyways, move on. Let's to the next. Let's talk about this. When you see people who are working a, a job they don't like, but it, it, it's, it pays maybe barely, if not even not enough, uh, for what they're trying to do and they just grind it out and the years go by versus the people who are making nothing pursuing an art versus the people who are fabricating something on social media that doesn't seem to be what do you have to say about all these things uh, my friend back here he hates the people fabricating stuff on social media because he's a numbers marketing guy so there's some guy i'm not gonna say his name but he was just the other day like oh i just bought this new house and he's like showing photos there and stuff and then we looked it up and it's on Airbnb. Like he Airbnb it and took photos there, you know? Some gnarly mansion. You see it so often though. It's like, uh, to, to. I don't like that. But as for the job people, I mean, excuse me. If you, that was actually, I already had one. Excuse me in the bag for that one. Um, but um, for the job people, uh, you're not easy to make laugh, huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just, just listening, man. I'm just tuned in. Okay. For the job people, um, if you have a family, whether they're your family that came from your nutsack or your vagina, or they're your family above you that you take care of, your sisters or brothers or whatever, niece, nephew, whoever, um, and you and you know pretty much you're put in that position to do so, or, or you should and could do so, uh, that I, I, I respect and I understand. I've, I'm, I've always pull out on time, so I've never had a kid, so I don't have to deal with that. And my, my rest of my family takes care of themselves. Um, do you have to, do you plan to have any children at this point in your life? Do you want kids? Do you, what is that looking like? I don't know. I can't, you don't have I don't to say. Know. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm not against it. Um, but I'm uh, definitely unorthodox in the sense that I don't, I don't feel the need to own a woman or something like that. So, I mean, even if I had a marriage, I, we'd probably have girlfriends and she could go do what she wants. I don't care. You know what I mean? <laughs> I think I just saw that Amber Heard secretly had like some child that was, I don't know how you word it, but I don't think there was like a partner involved and, you know, you're seeing that now, you know, people are just raising children without even a partner and stuff like it's. it's, it's I'm, I'm not against a kid. I just, well, one, I, at this point, I haven't had one for so long. I most certainly don't want to have one until I'm more than financially free again. Not only just financially free, but my money is working for, for itself. And I, I don't have to, you know, worry about a thing for him. He can pursue or her, pursue whatever. And, you know, I, I want to be able to take risks still right now, you know. How, how are you monetizing your work today? Is it, is it all coming directly from your music? Are you a full-time musician, a record producer? Um, I'm not monetizing it like I should be. I guess we have maybe have some money coming from a record that he's helping me promote that has like 350,000 streams right now um, called Avalanche on um, Spotify and wherever. It has 350 on Spotify. This guy's got me up to 30, 37,000 monthly listeners right now on Spotify. The actually real listeners, the say playlist placing, placing me. Um, Okay, you cut. You went all uh, rainbow colored for a second. I think um, it was a net. We're, we're good. Huh? We're good. That'll piece by very smoothly. No need to That's worry fine. about that. I don't know. I don't know who got hacked or what. But um, but I do. I have a it's deal. The Russians. With, uh, this is the first time I, uh, I I've spoken on it. But I I do have a deal 
with a guy named Peter Raffleson, who sold 300 million records. He wrote Open Your Heart for Madonna. He produced some stuff for Elton John, Stevie Nicks, Fleetwood Mac, Kendrick, Tyga, um, Gaga, Britney, a lot of people. And um, I have a deal with him where he agreed to, to start a, a label with me. And he agreed to raise five million dollars, which hasn't we haven't it's not we haven't done yet. I don't know if he's gonna do it or I'm gonna try to do it. And then I also have another partner who 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 is down for the cause, who likes the music that I have that is not out. And um I've known him for a while, but just recently we we met up and his name's Stevie J and he produced um Biggie Smalls, Jay Z Jodeci, 112, Mariah Carey, he's married to Faith Evans, he's on the show Love and Hip Hop, uh, he's an incredible musician, so those are my two music partners, so I mean, again, we intend to go extract some some, some marketing capital from somebody sometime soon, marketing and expense capital, and especially right now, billionaires have made like five trillion dollars over the plan, over the pandemic, sorry, plan, um, pandemic, and um, so, uh, People like labels and entertainment companies, they have a, they, they have the extra money to spend and checks they need to sign and write off. So, you know, we do want some operating costs uh, so we can pr proceed forward properly. What do you think about the fact that a lot of these artists who are popping up on TikTok via Instagram, Facebook, you know, they have all of this extra, this capital behind a machine that's marketing them forward on these sites. You know, a lot of it is based on the capital you put up front and they'll just allow it to go viral now, it seems. It seems like you have to buy your way in. You think it was always this way and we're just seeing it more up front? Is this something new? Well, I mean, in a sense, I guess it was always that way because... You know, back when it was just vinyls, you still had to sign to these people to even get a chance to record. So you were buying your way in by signing the deal with them, you know, So and them distributing. So in essence, it was always that way. I think now we do have a better shot of being independent if you want, which we were, we were just talking recently about maybe maybe talking to somebody that liked to be involved in music but isn't a music plantation, you know? So we have a little more control and less restriction, you know? Absolutely. Do you plan, would your ideal vision to be to help grow and facilitate other artists? Would you want to be producing your material? Would you ever see yourself as an agent? It seems like you're able to see a vision and, and see what it takes for people to do, you know. Would you ever look into doing something of this nature, bringing up other artists? No, 100%. That's 100% my intention. And I've, and I've done it, and I'm going to keep doing it. I'm going to, mostly I care about bands. I put a funny, funny, um, funny thing on my Instagram today. I was thinking about this quote in my head, and I, uh, and I, and then I seen a magazine at CBS, and it, and it says, it was Titanic. It said something, National Geographic Titanic, and I took a photo of it, and I posted, the only difference between the Titanic and most labels today this Titanic had better bands. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> that back? <laughs> That's pretty good. That's pretty so good. I'm, all, I'm all for bands and stuff. You know, I have, a, I have one band where I have all the members put together. We just haven't started the work yet, you know? Okay. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I, wanna, um, I, I produce my own stuff, but all I, I, I can sit and I can make music for 16 hours a day, no problem. It doesn't bother me one bit. So I, I have time to work with other people or whoever, you know? Why a band? Do you think that people need that live aspect because there's a lot of these bedroom producers and you need real people doing the instrument? Why is it the band that you're focusing on? Um, there's a couple of reasons. I guess I'd prefer there be more bands, so I don't mind giving this game away. Um, there's some things that I know how to do that I don't maybe discuss because, like, I have an upper hand by being able to cut certain corners right now. So until I'm fully on... I'm not necessarily going to tell the whole world they can do it this way and cut this corner and cut this expense in, until that I get a solidified position. Then I'm like, go ahead, run free. You know what I mean? Or here's this, you know, but right now, yeah, wormholes are fine for me. But um, but a band at least, which because I believe in the, the power of music, bands, well, one, there's, um, there's um, a Napoleon Hill who did Think and Grow Rich, Think You're a Way to Wealth, I believe, as well, and, and Outwitting the Devil, some other books. 
I've read all of them. Um, he spoke on, in Think and Grow Rich, the, uh, the mastermind principle. He said when two or three minds are gathered in the midst of one goal, it's like an energy pyramid, and it gets them there faster. And then uh, Jesus in the Bible, it says, you know, when two or more minds are gathered, I shall be there in the midst. So I do believe bands, um, one, I believe it puts uh, multiple energy ducats together or numerous. And then also it, um, it removes a bit of ego. So people can um, not just be like fanning out over one person and one thing. It's a, it's, it's a symphony of, of perfect sounds, hopefully, you know, and, and, and then you got a brand name and it's easier to support a brand than it is just to support, you know, Jeremy Rogers skateboards. It's, it's nicer. The idea of a brand, it's bigger than the person. Do you think it's better to be respected or feared, Jeremy? That's funny. Um, I prefer respected. Mm. Respected. I mean, that's my preference, but I'm a softy, you know, I don't literally or kill insects. So I prefer respected. Um, I wouldn't mind being feared, but, uh, right. Whatever. I'm not going to do anything bad. All the most I would ever do is allow somebody to do something bad if something extremely bad was done. Absolutely. The reason I ask is because it's such a difficult thing to be carrying a ship, like maneuvering a, a band, a group. There always seems to be a leader figure, and you see it time and time again where these big, great bands aren't able to manage the egos behind the group. You know, Pink Floyd, one of the greatest bands in history. They couldn't get along. Roger Waters and David Gilmour, you know, they could, and, you know, who knows what exactly took place. Only them. But with a lot of these bands, you win a lot of success. And I'm not sure if you saw this with skateboarding. Again, with, with the celebrity status that a lot of skateboarders achieved, including yourself, once it becomes at that level, you know, you know, you see it with Ryan Sheckler, right? He got the MTV show, and it looked like that was uh, very, uh, very negatively impactful in his life in many ways. And it's like sticking to what you do versus, you know, the, the notoriety you gain from it. Yeah, I mean, with our band that I had before, Fondue, we worked on it for a year, and um, and they helped me gain a lot of education and, and dealing with people delicately. Because early on, you know, I put the band together, created the name, flew them from New York into Danny Way's studio, and I was the um, I was the band leader, you know, and the and the main guy who used to be his band leader would tell me, you know, you're the band leader, you gotta this and that, you gotta deal with the saxophone player's ego, like literally, you got a sax player, you gotta deal with the drummer, you gotta deal with everything, and I didn't, uh, you know, I didn't understand as much at the time as I do now that, like, not making, even if I was unconsciously made a person feel smaller, like one time one of the people, not the singer, but uh, again, I'll just leave it, leave it out, because uh, he, we get, doesn't matter you know but but one time one of the guys who was like in a famous rock band before that was like when i'm around you you make me not feel like a rock star or something you know what i mean so like even like not even not sorry this thing's falling even what do you, what, what do you think he meant by that uh it just meant like he said he even made a funny comment about his dick and you can feel like he claimed before he had a baseball pad dick and he said you make my penis feel small you know like um, it's just so you don't thing. you don't stroke their egos as they probably wish to with other people. Maybe it's not even so much don't stroke, but maybe there's times where there's a term that I that I got recently from some a pretty wealthy person. It's uh, he talked about somebody else who's even wealthier, and he said, "Oh yeah, that guy he glows in the dark." What that means, glow in the dark, is like I don't need to put it in your face. Like I'm all for the disco. If the fucking lights go down. Yeah, let's party and rave. But before that, I don't need to put this fucking, Jesus, bro. I don't need to put this watch in your face. I don't need to do that or make you feel smaller or, or, or not only, not, not only do I not need to do that, I'm conscious of the fact that me not even trying to do that could do that if I'm not paying attention to being subtle and being toning down, you know? And, 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 a, and a billionaire is more likely to like this old billionaire, Casey Washerman, for, for this agency, Washerman Media Group I used to uh, skateboard for. He would come in the office and like flip flops and sandals and stuff because he has so much, you know, he doesn't want people hounding him and asking for a dollar, asking for this. It's at that point, he goes in the dark. He needs to tone down, you know. So I, I guess I believe in that more now and I understand the concept of that. 
glowing in the dark and, and letting, uh, helping and letting other people shine. Especially if you're already internally all the way lit. <laughs> We're officially done, you're off the hook. I don't need you for overtime. I use what I got, I think it's gonna be good. If you wanna leave our audience with anything, maybe uh, some quotes you like to you know, live by, some books, recommendations, that'll be a sharpshooter. We can create that for our social medias and stuff. Sure. Um, also, I've been waiting to make this song for a couple of days, a, a remix of some old rock band. Um, Steelers Will, I believe they're called. I'm gonna... Um, I want to send you it when I'm done. I think you'll like it. It's, it's, it's uh, I hear it in my head already, but, um, yeah. So, um, a couple quick quotes, fear of human opinion, disable success. I don't care the content of a conversation. I'm grateful to be the topic of one laws of nature work just as gravity does a law of nature. Um, like, unlike the secret, which teaches like attracts like, that's not always true. You can give out, love and if the cup is like this and it's more than half filled that person's operating off more love and faith and fear and doubt which would be the bottom half then you should rise the love and faith up in them but if they're halfway or lower then it can actually make them go down and uh, see what they're lacking what they see in you and lacking in themselves and cause them to attack and stuff so don't be surprised if if love doesn't always attract love it doesn't always work that way um, and then for books, I'd say, um, I'd say one of the first books so much to start with, if they haven't read a lot of, um, self-empowering books is The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho. Um, you should probably read all of Napoleon Hill, but most importantly, Think and Grow Rich and then Outwitting the Devil, where Napoleon's, whether he is or he isn't, it's, uh, conducted in the form of a conversation with the devil. And he asks the devil all these kinds of questions and he gives him uh, very um, undeniable, logical truths. Um, then Miguel Ruiz, Four Agreements, um, The Power of Now, Eckhart Tolle. Um, I don't support these actions. They're, it's a very malicious, amoral book and books. But I've read all of Robert Greene which is 48 Laws of Power, The Art of Seduction, 33 Strategies of War, uh, Mastery of Fate, which is a better one, more humane, humane laws of, no, human laws of nature, much more humane, and 50th Law, which is a book about 50. That's really good. Um, nice. But the way, yeah, those are good. There's, but sometimes it's just good to know that you could be sitting across the table from someone who might be like up to one of these manipulative acts. So that's why that information is good. And very history based. Um, very nice. And, and I guess the seed of the soul would be a good one. Very nice. Well, you guys heard it here, Jeremy. We have we can expect new music from you. What else? Um, I do want to. I have a friend who who's a, a a big person in the flower industry. He he's Costa Rica based, and he wants me to go to Costa Rica and film my last video part. I'd like to do that, but I want to film it the way that. There's a kid, Bobby Bills, that I follow, and then one other kid from L.A. where they're using a certain kind of camera, and it looks really crazy, really slow-mo and artsy. I'd like to make, if I do another video part, make it like an art piece. And there's always a classical song I wanted to use, Clarity Loon, Claude Debussy, and so just a piano piece. And I just, I can picture it in my head, like a ledge ballet, classical, whatever. Are you going to release a new part, you say? I'd like to, yes. I have, but I actually have a fucking... I had never done this before, but I popped my shoulder out the other day. Can you see it there? Yeah, I can see that. Yep. Wow. Yeah, I actually, I need to go to the ER and try to pop it back in. I've never done that. I don't know. I try to get it back in myself, but it hasn't worked. It's been out for... Uh, do you feel less strength in that arm? Does that arm feel a little, a little weird? It, it actually got... Most of its motion back, 
I was with some, I was with some groceries. <laughs> I was, I had a bag. I was with some groceries and I skated at home the other day down a hill and I was trying to go slow and I have a heel bruise. My back is a little hurt from that. And, and I fell and I put my arm down and, and it hurt really bad because I, I was maybe going to be like, just be over it. Cause I, I talked to an ex of mine, this girl, Bambi, who's an amazing woman. And she showed that she had a, her shoulders popped out like that. And she said she never fixed it. And it's fine. She's like, it'll just sit out a little funny, which I, I don't care about that. I have like, you know, whatever. Yeah. Well, look at that. yeah so I, I, I mean, I don't care if it's sat out, but if it's going to be susceptible to more pain when I, when I fall, I don't really want that. Even though I don't, Probably we're not going to do that much falling over the rest of my life. I hope. Um, I, but I just don't want it that I'm going to need surgery later. So that's why I might go to the ER in the next day or two and see um, if okay. I can put it back in. This is something you're familiar with, though, since you were young in your career as a skateboarder. You know all about the ba- the battle scars, and you know it happens. But you're working towards your part. I'm sure people are going to love to see this. You know, that's very exciting. You know. Very nice, Jeremy. I really appreciate you for being on our show today. Cheers. Cheers, Jeremy.